so much for coming and um, utilizing your Sunday afternoon on this session, may Allah reward and bless each one of you for your time and your efforts. Um, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Saima Zia. Um, I have a bachelor's in business and finance. I'm also a domestic violence advocate. Um, I've been volunteering with, with Narika, which um, who are here. They have set up a table. Um, they're a domestic violence organization, um, primarily working with the South Asian community. And they work, they have helpline and case management, and they also have a, um, a phenomenal uh, program called SEED, which sounds for um, self-efficiency economic development. So within this program, it's basically an empowerment, women's empowerment program for uh, DV, primarily for DV survivors. And I've been hosting their financial literacy sessions. They also have career building, resume, um, computer literacy skills. So um, that's kind of where I started my journey. And so we, we, you know, by working with women um, uh, over the last few years, I've just realized that there's such a dire need of learning this uh, among our community. So I've just started to roll this out to the community at large, inshallah, inshallah, I hope it, it benefits. Um, so yeah, feel free to, uh, we're gonna take a break in uh, you know, about an hour's time, so feel free to check out Narika's resources um, and you know find out about the organization, what they do, and also just how you can get involved. They are looking for volunteers, so as well as a, uh, a resource, it's a, it's a great place to volunteer. It's been uh, life-changing for me personally. So, um, so inshallah, we can start. So the topics for today, um, primarily I'm gonna cover about six different topics. We're gonna do an introduction to what financial literacy is. Uh, we're gonna set some financial goals. We're gonna talk about budgeting we're going to be looking at savings and the different types of bank accounts. We'll discuss loans, credit, so that will include credit cards, credit score and credit reports. And briefly, if we have time, we'll discuss investments. So why take this class? So inshallah, the objectives for today is each one of us has an obligation to seek and arm ourselves with knowledge. We, we want to, um, you know, they say knowledge is power. So we, we have an obligation to, to seek that knowledge. Also to help you become effective in managing your money and to help you secure your financial future. So it's considered a, a life skill. And most importantly, to help provide economic empowerment. And so I just want to take a quick poll. How many sisters are working here? So we have kind of half and half. Okay. Okay. So I think um, the mis misconception is, um, you know, a lot of the sisters who are not working, who are relying on financially dependent on their spouses, they think they don't need to be active in managing their finances uh, at, uh, at home. And that this is why financial literacy is so critical to learn. So what is financial literacy? And I will share the presentation with, with you, so don't feel obliged to take um, photos of each screen. Um, so in, in simplistic terms, financial literacy, it's the possession of skills that allow people to make smart decisions about their money. So it's as simple as that, it just helps you make better decisions about your money. So that can entail whether you're trying to save money, whether you're, uh, you know, how to spend your money more wisely. So who should learn about financial literacy? Any ideas? Who should learn? Yeah, exactly. Everybody, regardless of who you are, even the president, right? So we all should be financial literate. So there's two uh, key components. Um, first is that financial literacy is where you're actually learning the, the, the concepts of, of, of finance. And then the second component is financial management. So this is where you're actually doing the, the, the managing of the finances. And one, one tool that is used for the financial management is budgeting, and, and we'll discuss that. 
So with anything in life, we need to set goals for ourselves, whether they're personal goals, professional goals, academic goals. Similarly, with finance, we need to set financial goals. What is a goal? A goal is an effort. It's an aim. It's a desired result. What are your goals financially? It could be you're trying to you know, pay off some debt. You're trying to save up for a car. You're trying to save up for a house. Why should you have financial goals? To help you make better decisions, better financial decisions. So whether it's you're trying to save some money, you're trying to spend your money more efficiently, and it just gives you that sense of achievement. So with financial goals, we specifically use a criteria called SMART. Anyone heard of SMART goals? So they're kind of mostly used in the professional context, but um, they can be applied ev everywhere. And I find them particularly useful when you're setting financial goals for yourself. So what is SMART? S is for specific. This is where you will state exactly what needs to be done with your money. M is for measurable. What evidence do you have to show for this? A is for attainable. You have to create a step-by-step -step guide on how to achieve this goal by keeping a record. R is for relevant. How realistic is your goal? So for the finance goals, you will need to look at your income and your expenditure. T, time bounds. What is the time frame involved in terms of when the goal will be achieved? So an example of a financial goal. So a general goal will be, I, I want to pay off my loan. Right, that's a general goal. But when you use your SMART criteria, what does your SMART financial goal look like? So I've, I'm just using an example here. So specific I want to pay off $5,000 off my loan in 24 months. Me M for measurable. How will you go about measuring this? I will set up a budget so I can save $200 a month to help me pay it off. A, attainable. How will I achieve this? I will cut my expenses on clothes and food so I'm able to save $200 by making a budget. So this is the plan I've set up to help me achieve that goal. R for relevant. How realistic is this goal? So I've looked at my current expenses and I've looked at my income and I think I can achieve it. T, time bound. 24 months is enough time for me to save up. So this is one example of a financial goal using the SMART criteria. So once you've identified your goal using the SMART criteria, the next step is to categorize your goal in either a short-term, a medium-term, or a long-term goal. Short-term goals are goals that you will achieve within the next three months. So an example could be, I want to save up for a iPad within the next two months. So that will be my short goal because it's within zero to three months. Medium term goals are goals typically that are achieved within three months to 12 months. So perhaps it could be you're trying to save up for a laptop by the end of the year. That will be considered a medium term goal. Long term goal is something that can be achieved a year beyond. So these are typically for longer term, you know, kind of bigger purchases and bigger investments. So maybe a down payment for a house or you're saving up for a car. Those are examples of uh, long-term goals. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of do a quick group. I, don't, I want to keep this interactive and not bore you with, with just me talking. So keep this a bit interactive. So can any of you give me an example of a smart financial goal? And then once you've thought of a smart financial goal, if you can help categorize that in either a short term, a medium term, or a long term goal. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to, to think of one and then we can discuss, inshallah.
So you so using the SMART criteria, how will you how will you use your SMART criteria for that goal? That's a that's a very good goal. You want to pay off your student student loan. So then, how would you using the SMART criteria? How would you go about uh, uh, you know having that goal? So you have to be specific. So you, it doesn't have to be accurate figures. You could even make them up, right? So, you know, whatever the student loan is. So do you want to think of an, uh, an amount? And um, we, can, we, can do this, we can do this together. So, okay, let's pick 7,000. So, okay, so, spe so specifically we're going to use the amount. So specifically I want to pay off $7,000 off my student loan. And then do you have a time frame in, in mind? Um, oh, yeah, okay. So that's how you're going to start off. I will pay off $7,000 of my student loan in a year, right? That's your S part. Next is measurable. So how will you go about measuring that? Well, I would divide by uh, 7,000 for a month. Right. Yeah, yeah. So whatever that monthly amount is, you, you will set that money aside. Um, and, and, and save whatever that amount is of, uh, on, uh, on a monthly basis. So that's how you're going to measure it. And then how will you attain that? So how will you... Okay, so you'll work part-time. Um, so also under attainable, you need to have a plan, right? So working is one, definitely. Um, so, uh, you, you know, you have to create um, a... Um, like a step-by-step -step plan. So working is one, so you're going to increase your income. And then in order to pay off this loan, perhaps you may need to cut up, cut some expenses, right? So that you're able to save that monthly amount to pay off that loan. So, um, so that will be how you're, you're going to attain it, you're going to achieve it. So working, and then you're going to cut off, cut, cut off your expenses. Um, and then do you think it's, it's a realistic So one, one tool that when we talk about relevant, one tool that we use to check if your goal is relevant is um, uh, working on a budget. And that's going to be our next topic. So, uh, you know, in your goal, the relevant, the realistic um, part will be I, I'm going to prepare a budget and see that, you know, um, if I can achieve it. And then the time frame you've already given is one year. So that's so. So this is this is the whole point of this exercise because we all set very generalized goals, but specifically finance-related goals, you have to be very specific. You have to have a plan in place, and um, you know just keep it very very narrowed. Um, so yeah, great example, Jazakallah Adam for sharing. Anyone else? So is that what would you put that under a, a short-term, medium-term, or a long-term goal? Yeah, if it's going to be within a year, then it's considered a medium for excellent. Mashallah, Jazakallah. And anyone else would like to share a smart financial goal? Anyone? Or if anyone can give me an example of a, a short-term goal? Okay. Is that something that you're, you want to do within the next few months? Because remember, short-term... Sorry. For summer. Okay, so that will more likely be a medium-term goal. So short-term is literally with zero to three months. So, you know, between now and April, right? That's, that's a short-term goal. So that will come under a medium-term goal. What about anyone else who, uh, an example of a, a long-term goal? Yeah, sister, go ahead. Okay. Alhamdulillah, okay. for for the down payment. Um, so just to pay off the credit card. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, and, perfect. And so uh, then I would have to budget to see what I would need to pay to get all the other answers. Oh, I see. Okay. So 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 typically, um, yeah. Once we we kind of dive into the the budgeting, this will be a, a bit more easier to 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 process because a budget does play a big part in setting financial goals. So, yeah, but alhamdulillah. Um, and so that does lead to budgeting. Does any, has anyone heard of a budget? Okay, a few sisters have. 
How often, the sisters who raise their hands, how often do you budget? No? No one budgets here? You've just heard of it? You budget? Monthly, okay. Okay. So I, I find this shocking. I really do. Because pretty much every cohort I've taught, uh, this is the same response. We've heard of it, or actually the last one I did, they hadn't even heard of budgeting. But it's, it's like if, if there's one thing you sisters can take away from this session, is budgeting, how to make a budget. So, um, yeah, very, very key, key aspect. I wanted to quickly share a video with you about the importance of budgeting. Okay, so from the video, we see that uh, a budget is basically a tool that will help you make critical spending decisions and helps you to achieve your financial goals. It helps you ensure you don't spend money that you don't have. It helps you know how much money you've earned, how much money you've spent, and how much money you are planning to or have to save. It helps you identify spending leaks and budget busters. So the, the budget comprises of two key components. You have an, the income and then you have the expenses. Can anyone tell me what an expense is? Go ahead. Right, so, so expense or expenditure is things that you have to pay or the cost of, of an item. And so when we, when we speak about expenses, it's really important to identify the distinction between what a need is and what a want is. So a need, as the name suggests, is something that we have to have in order to survive. A want is something that is not essential, but it makes our life easier. Can anyone give me an example of a need? Shelter, food, water, right? Those are things that we have to have for our survival. What about a want? Vacation, home decor, yeah. Any other examples? Netflix, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a, a, a very um, kind of nitty-gritty one. So I, my example is, you know, a, a need is a glass of water, right? We need water to survive. And then a want will be, you know, occasionally it's nice to have a sparkling glass of water, right? So it's not critical, but it's, it's nice to, to give that enjoyment. So this distinction is extremely important because, you know, there is a correlation between our emotions and spending. You know, most of us have heard of retail therapy and impulse buying, right? You go into a retail store, you go in for two things, you come out with 10 others, right? So, um, but, so before you spend, it's, it's important to ask yourself some key questions. Firstly, you know, did I compare? So when you, you know, you go into a store and you find something, you know, did, did I compare the prices? You know, sometimes you can find that same item online cheaper or in another store cheaper. But because of your impulse, you're, you just quickly purchase it. Then you need to find out, is this a need or is this a want, right? A lot of us have been in that situation where, you know, we, we go in, we find a nice pair of shoes, and then we come home and we're just adding those shoes to our collection, right? It's not really a need. It's more a want. It's, it's good to have a different color or different style. So before you spend, ask yourself, do I really need this or do I want this? And then particularly for larger purchases, is this going to cause a delay in reaching my goals? If you have to borrow money, so if you're having to use your credit card for these large purchases, it's obviously going to take you longer to reach your goals. So I've just put together some things that we can do without having to break the bank. You know, like I said, kind of our emotions are linked with spending. So, you know, some of us go and cheer ourselves up by going shopping. 
So um, there are ways to, um, you know, you know, cheer yourself up without having to financially spend big amounts of money. So some examples of treating yourself, you know, I'm a big advocate of self-care. So you can give yourself a manicure, right? You can enjoy a favorite dessert at home. You could read a good book. You could spend some time with a, with a good friend. You could take a nice walk or a hike. You could invite your friends over for potluck and share the cost of the food. With your children, we know with our, especially when they're a lot younger and you take them shopping, they're, you know, they've always, I know my kids when they were longer, younger, they would go and touch, we want this, we want that. And we just satisfy their needs. So, the, you know, other ways to, to treat your children without bank, breaking the bank, you can cook or bake together. You could read them a story. You could spend some time at the library. You could play a favorite game with them. You could invite their friend for a sleepover. So these are just, you know, just some examples I've put together to just get you guys thinking that you don't have to go spending to, you know, enjoy yourself. Um, so the one component um, of, the, of the budget, and we'll go through a sample budget together, is income. So typically income is, is what? When we hear the word income, what does, what does that mean? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, your, so your, typically it's your earnings, your wages, your salary. So it's, it's, as the name suggests, I usually remember it's income. So it's money coming in, right? And so I've just put together some resources. Um, uh, benefits.org is a, a, a place where you can find federal benefits information if you are eligible for any public assistance. There's cash assistance, child support, food stamps, free or reduced lunch, uh, Medicare. Uh, you'll need proof of identity, income, and asset proof. If you are staying in any shelter, you can get priority processing. And then there's another government program to um, help needy families, and that's temporary assistance for needy families, TAMF. So this is an example of a, of a sample budget, and uh, we'll actually do one together so that um, you can work through this. So when you prepare a budget, there's, can you guys see me for, let me just see if I can move this so that people can, okay. So when you start off with a budget, there's three steps involved. That's the best way of, of remembering. I'm going to keep it very simple so that you understand the concept. So the first step is you have to identify your income, right? And so we've just discussed that income is money that's coming in. So some examples. Can, can you guys help me out here? I want to make this interactive. Some examples of income? Salary. Salary. Okay, so salary. What else? Rent. I have a house. Oh, yeah, if you're renting uh, your house, I'm going to put rent, uh, rent out of house. Any other examples of income? Monthly income from my inheritance. Okay, so monthly income inheritance. Okay. Any other examples? Child support. Child support. Yeah. That's an example of income. Any others? Dividend. Dividend. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Mashallah. Dividend. What else? We can put a monthly. I don't know if you know if you you could get spousal support. I'm just going to put this under one category: spousal support or allowance. Right, your partner may be giving you an allowance on a monthly basis that will be considered your income. Right. So those are uh, some examples of of income. And I'm just, just to kind of make it easy, I'm, I'm going to use some figures because, uh, you know, we're making a budget. So for salary, I'm going to put salary or wages, right? 
And this budget I'm going to work on is going to be on a monthly basis. So the frequency of a budget is the bare minimum should be monthly, right? The bare minimum. If you can do one weekly, fantastic. If you can do one bi-weekly, even better. But the bare minimum is to do it monthly. And my suggestion is that you should do this at the beginning of the month so that it will help you forecast your, you know, expenditure for that month. So I do it at the beginning of the month and then you've got this plan to help you with your financing for that month. So minimum is, is monthly. So I'm just going to make some, uh, you know, fictitious uh, figures up here. So wages, uh, I'm going to put 500. Uh, rent, 300. I'm just keeping the figures basic so that we can get our maths. Okay. So that is your first step, right? You're going to identify all your income on a monthly basis. Number two, the step is now you will look at your expenses, right? And so expenses, like we said, is money that is going out. You're spending that money, right? So under expenses, these usually come under two main categories. You have fixed expenses. Any ideas on what fixed expenses are? Rent. Sorry? Rent. Rent. So fixed expenses, like the name suggests, are those expenses that are fixed every month you will have to pay, it's the same amount every month. So an example of a fixed expense is rent. Okay. Any other examples of a fixed expense? Yes, electric, phone, So electric, utilities I wouldn't put under, phone possible, even phone I wouldn't put under a fixed expense because it depends on your usage, right? So uh, rental, so re I'm going to put rent or mortgage as an example of a fixer because that won't change on a monthly basis. What else? Any other examples of a, a fixed expense? Insurance. Insurance, yep. Insurance. What else? I would put those... Um, they wouldn't be you. Won't, you won't be spending the same amount, right, on a monthly basis on growth. So they will actually go in my in my next category, which is variable, right? Variable or flexible. So this, when you when, so when when we're looking at expenses, it's really important to have this distinction, right? Identify what are your fixed expenses. And what are your variable expenses? So going back to the fix, we have rent, mortgage, insurance. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. So any loan payments? You may have a, 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 a car loan, right? That would be considered, uh, if it's fixed every month, that's considered a fixed expense. Any others? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Those are going to be, I'm just going to put here monthly subscription that will be fixed. So, mashallah, you understand the, the, the concept is that it's those uh, amounts that, that do not change on a month-to-month -month basis. So, once you've identified your fixed expenses, your next uh, expense is your variable or flexible expenses, right? So, can I get examples of variable expenses? Those that expenses that are going to change on a month-to-month -month basis. Yes, sure. So, yeah. These, these ones are more easier, right? So, obviously, food, right? That's the big one. Food or groceries I'll put as, as one. Okay. Utilities. So, under utilities, gas, electricity, I'll put phone here. Someone had mentioned phone. What else as a... Credit card bills, yep. Credit card. Yep. Any others? So I, I, you understand the concept, right? It's basically those amounts that are going to change on a month-to-month -month basis. So I'm going to put some figures up here. 
So uh, rent mortgage, again, I'm just trying to keep the math basic. Um, let's do 600 rent. Actually, I'll change this, not 600, 300. I'm just keeping it basic for our math. So it's Okay, so we've identified our income, we've identified our expenses, right? So then your fixed expenses and your variable expenses, you're going to add those up. So three, four, five, six, seven. So my fixed expenses are 700. I'm going to add my income up, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, so 1250, right? My income is 1250 and my expenses are 700 okay? And then the third step, which is the final step of a budget, is you're going to, I'm going to label this as A, right? A is your income. Expenses is B. Step three is you are going to subtract A from B. So you're going to subtract your income from your expenses and that amount will tell you a lot of things. So 1250 minus 700, how much? 550. Okay, so we have a surplus of $550, right, for this month. So, we're, so, th so when, you, when you do this calculation, the, the expenses, so the income, minus the expenses, you either get a positive, so in our, in our case, obviously, it's a positive number, right? So this is considered a budget surplus, or you will get a negative number. So uh, a positive number, I'm just going to put this over here. So a positive number at the end is a budget surplus, right? And if you get a negative number, that is considered to be a budget deficit. So when you get a positive, so what is the aim in the budget? Would you like to see a positive number or a negative number? Yeah, ideally, ideally you would like to see a positive. Realistically, it is not you know, very frequent that we get a, a positive surplus, but ideally we would, that's the aim, to get a positive number. So when we get a positive number, what does that mean? What, what does that surplus tell us? Yes, excellent. A lot of people get excited. I've got this extra money I can go spending, right? But the key of doing this is that it helps you realize that you need to put some money aside for that rainy day. And then if you have a negative, so if, for example, in our case, if this was a negative, a, a deficit of 550, what does that mean? Exactly, exactly. You are spending more, so you are spending more than what you are getting in, right? And that should be a red flag. So what if, you, if this was a negative, then you have to look at your expenses firstly and see where are my spending leaks? What is it in my expenses I can do to change to, you know, to reduce my expenses? So it could be under food, for example. Perhaps you're spending money on, you know, restaurants and eating out. So that is considered a speeding, uh, uh, sorry, a spending leak, right? Or, and, and it's considered a budget buster. You can, uh, for perhaps your utilities, you can, you know, cut down on your usage of whatever gas, electricity. So that, that negative number, you have to review your expenses first and foremost. Once you've looked at your expenses and you've seen that there's nothing you can change, right? You've, 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 done, you, you've done that overview. At that point, then you will have to look at your income, right? If your expenses, like whatever you have, you can't reduce them any further, then you will have a look at your income. And you have to find ways of increasing that income so you're able to meet your expenses. So there's any questions on, on the budget? No? 
everyone gets the the concept. It, I, I think kind of mentally we've um, you know we just think it's it's an extremely difficult concept to you know to um, to handle, but it's really pretty straightforward. I think once you've grasped that there's th literally these three steps involved. You're identifying your income, identifying your expenses, and then you're just subtracting one from the other. Uh, and like I said, uh, you know, the bare minimum is to do this monthly. And so, the, you know, some ways of preparing a budget, um, I, a lot of my clients I work with, they, they keep it very simple. They prepare one in a notebook on a monthly basis, um, you know, just uh, like a, a record they keep. Uh, if you do have great tech skills, then you can um, do an Excel spreadsheet. You can prepare one on, on that, and it, you know, you've got an, uh, an online version. There are some apps um, available, too, uh, that you can use for, uh, for a budget. And uh, those are um, uh, one very good one is called Mint. Mint, anyone used Mint? You've used Mint? Have you found it very useful? Okay, so Mint is a, is a good one. And then there's another one, AARP, Monthly Map App. Um, and like I said, my, my advice is, if you can, please prepare this at the beginning of the month because it's a great forecast for, for that month. Okay, so moving on. Um, so once you've established your budget, um, uh, another very important concept is an asset. Anyone heard of an asset? You've heard? Okay. So what is an asset? In very simplistic terms, asset is something you own. So it's property that is owned by a person or company, and it, and it can be used to meet your debt and other commitments. And it's important, particularly for us women, um, to take stock of our assets. We should make a list of our assets individually. We should have a, a list of our assets that are jointly owned with our spouses. And we should also have a list or at least try to get a list of assets that your spouse owns. So uh, e examples of assets is a, a house, a car, any collections, this can include jewelry, insurance, cash, bank accounts, investments, right? These are all considered as assets. And the opposite to this is a, a liabilities. What is a liability? A liability in simplistic terms is what you owe. So it's a legally binding obligation that is payable to another person or company. And again, similarly with assets, you, we should take stock of our liabilities, keep a list of those that we have uh, individually, uh, those that are jointly owned, and liabilities that are owned by your partner. Examples of liabilities, credit cards, payment plans, and loans. So someone mentioned, yes, sister, go ahead. Paying on your house. Yes. Where does it fall as an asset? Yes, yes. It's yeah. It's still considered an asset. Yeah. You mean like if you have a mortgage? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's still considered a, a, an asset. Yeah. So, so I think someone mentioned saving. Um, so so saving. I, ideally, there should be two categories of of saving. We should have an emergency savings and long-term savings. So long-term savings, as the name suggests, are savings that are typically for um, over a year. How many sisters here have individual saving accounts? How many sisters have joint accounts? Okay. I, going back to the group reflection, so personally, I, I do recommend we should each have our own saving account. Um, the, it's good to have, obviously, a joint account, but you don't know about the rainy day. And the field that I'm in, it's just really unfortunate to, to hear and see the situations people are in because they didn't have their own saving account. So I think for our own 
particularly of our own financial empowerment, we should, you know, we should start having one. Um, and so the emergency savings fund is, um, as the name suggests, is savings that you set aside for emergencies. And, you know, with, with life being so unpredictable, right, there could be uh, a loss of income at home, your car can break down, there could be sickness, a death of a loved one, right? So we really need to save some funds for, for this emergency for that rainy day. And, and, and this savings fund provides a safety net and a cushion in the event of an um, you know, unexpected or, or tragic event. So it's best to be prepared. So generally, the rule of thumb of emergency fund is you should have between three to six months of your living expenses in that fund. So this includes whether it's uh, your rent payment, your mortgage payment, uh, utilities, it should cover your, you know, your food bill. So th around three to six months as, as a ballpark figure for your uh, emergency fund. But, you know, keep, keep your uh, emergency fund gold realistic. If you think the three to six months is too much, then the bare minimum at least have one month's housing costs covered, right? So if your mortgage is or your rent is, just say, $3,000 a month, right, the bare minimum in your emergency savings fund, you should aim at having that amount so that you're able to cover one month of your housing fees. And, and once you've met that goal, then you, know, you can obviously add to it. Um, and, and so the, the other important point to make here is, you know, we have to be consistent. I think, you know, a, a lot of us fall in this trap where we, we, we put some money aside for, for saving, but it's not consistent, right? So it's good to start small. It's good to save $10 a week right, but every week rather than I'm going to save up $50 and put that money away. So it's advisable to, to have a small goal for, for putting that money away, but just be consistent. And, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can do this by, uh, you know, automatic transfer or, or direct deposit. And an example is um, if you're saving $10 a month, right, and it's getting 2% interest, in five years, this would go up to $612. So they are huge. Even if you're saving that small amount, there's huge advantages. So with the bank accounts, there's three main, uh, three categories of uh, bank accounts. There's, there's more, but these are the three very popular ones. The most common ones are the interest earning savings accounts. I'm, I'm sure most of you have, had, have heard of these. These are the common ones. So these are deposit accounts that earn you interest. Uh, they are safe. They are for storage. And um, they're not really for daily use, right? You've just put this money, uh, you've just put this money away. I think I've missed a, have I missed a slide? No, okay. Um, so you've put this money away. Um, it's, so it's not for daily use. If you are looking for account for daily use, then you can utilize a checking account. So with the checking account, you get a checkbook, you get an ATM, uh, a debit card, um, and, and so that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis, but that, that doesn't have interest uh, accrued on that account. The other uh, group of accounts are called MMAs, money market accounts. So these are, this is also a type of saving account, but this pays interest on um, uh, interest rates that occur in money markets. So banks trade with each other, Right, they have their, their own interest rates. So these interest rates on the MMAs are based on the, 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 the rates that are used between the banks. Um, these accounts typically do pay higher rates of interest uh, than traditional savings account, but they, uh, they have some kind of stricter conditions. They require a higher minimum balance, and there are limits on the number of transactions that are allowed per month. 
And the third common um, safety uh, saving uh, option is CDs, also known as certificates of deposit or agreements. Um, they're also referred to as maturity bonds. So this is a good option if you don't need immediate access with your funds. And you usually get these as a fixed terms. They could be as short as three months. You can get a six-month term, a year term, and it goes up to about six years. So the only thing with this is um, if you want to make early withdrawals from CDs, they will penalize you. So you have to make sure that if you want to consider CDs, that you don't need access to your funds. They're kind of more for longer term investments, but they do offer a better rate of interest than your regular um, savings accounts. So the best advice when you are looking at a saving account is basically just shop around. Um, Moneyrates.com is a really good resource to give you that comparison. Um, the, not only do they provide saving accounts, uh, comparisons per bank, because every bank charges their own competitive rates. They also give you credit cards um, options, loan options on this website. So you can do a, a comparison between each bank and see which, which rates are, are working better for you. The other resource is uh, this website, rates.savingsaccounts.com. That also shows you the comparison. So, do you know, do your research, read the fine print, um, make sure you don't feel pressurized. Like, if you need immediate access to your funds, don't look at long term savings, right? Then you would consider regular saving accounts. Um, you want to make sure that you get your money, you know, without worrying about longer term commitments. Um, Chime, I've heard, I've not used this personally, but I've heard Chime is a, is a good account to use to open up a savings account. Um, there's no minimum balance. We'll look at fees um, as, as well, but um, there's, there's no man, minimum balance or minimum fees involved in this. So that's a suggestion for a bank account. Some banking tips. Um, so typically, the, for um, to open a bank account, you, you know, you need your personal information, your name, date of birth, your residence, an ID number. So typically, your SSN number, tax identification number. If you're working, your employer ID. Um, once you have, how many people have a, a debit card here? Okay, so you're familiar with, um, you know, obviously you have a PIN and how to access an, an, an ATM machine. And so, yeah, just remember to keep your PIN. I know this, for some of you, it's self, you know, common sense, self-explanatory, but a lot of sisters do not know this. So it's just, a, I'm, I'm just giving an overall, um, you know, reminder to, to everyone. Keep your PIN safe. Do not share it with anyone. Be aware of all banking fees, and, and we'll discuss fees in, in detail. And then when you use your ATM, typically, um, you know, it's advisable to use the ATM that is owned by your bank. If you decide to use an ATM, you, you know, belonging to another bank, you will get charged. So you need to make sure that the ATM is in within, you know, within the network. So types of banking. Um, Internet banking, so how many people can tell me if internet banking and online banking, what the difference is? Anyone know the difference between internet banking and online banking? Okay, they're basically the same, right? <laughs> internet and online banking is, a, but there, there is a misconception that there is a difference, so that's why, but internet banking and online banking, it's the same. So um, it's basically the financial transactions are conducted over the internet through a bank's website, secure website. So with, with the online internet banking, the bank may have physical branch locations, and additionally, it will give you an online option. So, for example, Bank of America, we know that they have physical branches, right? But then there is also an option to bank with them online. Um, 
Online banking also covers banks that do not have a physical branch. They're just solely online. So you, there's, you know, the, there's, two, there's two types of banks with that. So usually with the internet banking and online banking, you must register with that bank. You have to make a um, create an account. You'll get a, a, a user ID and you'll get a password. And that's how you'll be able to access your online banking. So the advantage for online banking, mostly for banks, it saves them a lot of money, right? Because uh, particularly ones that are just solely doing this online, they don't need to worry about the cost of, you know, uh, having a location, their staff, everything is being done online. Uh, for the customers, people like, you know, it's just convenience, right? That you're just doing this on your on your desktop. Um and um, and particularly, you know, with with the banks, there's opening times and closing times, so you can do this. It's accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that's the other um, advantage of an online banking. What are the features of online banking? Customers can pay bills online. You could transfer money from one account to another. You can view your account balances at any time of the day. You can view or print statements from the comfort of your home. You can view images of checks. And you can even apply for loans or credit cards online. Anyone here has an online account? Anyone? OK, quite a few. So yeah, so Mashallah, you know that there's huge, huge benefits, huge advantages of this doing it at the comfort of our home. So the other um, banking uh, aspect is mobile banking. What is the difference between a mobile banking and online banking? There's one specific key difference. Sorry. Yeah, so, so basically mobile banking, as the name suggests, it's done through your phone, right? So you download a, an app from that bank. So going back to the Bank of America example, you download their app. And then you're able to do everything that, you know, from all these features you have, you can do this from your phone. You, you know, you, 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 mobile banking is only done on your smartphone or tablet, not on your desktop. And then you've got the, uh, you know, additional feature of text messages and SMS. Any questions on the, the different types of banking? So you obviously you have your in-person, you have your online, your, your internet banking, and then you have the, the mobile banking. Okay, so I, I touched upon fees. Um, so when you're, when you're choosing bank accounts, please, please look for and ask for the fee schedule, right? Because every bank account has fees imposed. So I've just put together three or four kind of main, there's a lot more. These are the kind of common ones. Overdraft fees. These are fees mostly for checking accounts. So what do we mean by overdraft fees? So if you don't have enough money in your bank account and you're trying to cover a transaction, right, the banks will charge you an overdraft fee. And typically on average, it's about $35 per transaction. So, you know, please, before you open up an account, just make sure you know what your overdraft limit is and then if there are any overdraft fees. Because if you have insufficient funds in your account and a transaction is made, the fee will be charged. So just, just be vigilant and, and, and careful on, on your overdraft fees. And like I said, this is mostly for your checking accounts. The other common fee is a minimum balance fee. So this is a fee that is, when you, when you open an account, these are fees that they charge to maintain a minimum balance for your account. If you can't maintain this balance, so for example, the account may entail $500, right, that you have to have $500 for this, um, you know, on a monthly basis. If you can't maintain this balance, you will be charged a minimum balance fee. Another type of fee is a maintenance fee, right? So this is, uh, this is like a monthly fee, um, and it's basically to service and maintain the account. 
Some banks allow you to avoid this fee if you set up direct deposit, right? So if there's regular activity in your account, you can try to avoid this fee. So please check with, with your bank. ATM fees. So I spoke about using your debit card, uh, you know, for, um, for the ATMs that are within network of your bank. So, you know, to avoid these fees, please only use the ATMs that are within, within network. Uh, other fees, there's also wire fees if you are transferring money abroad, um, making other wire transactions, some banks do charge for that. So it's just really crucial and advisable to obtain a fee schedule so that you know exactly what charges are being made and, and what the fees are. Okay, how are we doing for time? Um, okay, I think we can take like a, a two, three minute break uh, and then we can dive into our next topic. You can stretch and grab some water and yeah, inshallah. We'll resume uh, yeah, around 3.40, inshallah. Okay, so our next topic is credit. So within credit, uh, we will look at credit score, credit reports, and credit cards. So why is credit important? Any ideas? Why do you think it's important to have credit? You kind of need it for everything. Sorry? You kind of need it for everything. Yeah, absolutely. So it basically it gives you financial power. Right? This financial power can help you take up take out loans, um, purchase a car purchase get a credit card right so it just it, it basically to sum it up it just gives you that the that financial power so the first element of um when we when we look at credit is the first component is to look at the credit score so a credit score is basically it's a number it's a numerical value that's given and it depicts your credit worthiness Right, and so it, it's assigned to a person that indicates to lenders your capacity to repay a loan. So it depends on your credit cards, any um, you know, payments you have, any loans you have. Uh, employers may look at your credit score. If you are um, trying to lease an apartment, your rental agents will look at your credit score. If you're applying for loans, your your loan, the banks, financial institutions will look at your credit score. Yeah. Is it true that if you check your credit score, it lowers it? Yeah. So if you check it, it doesn't lower it, uh, and we'll go into this. But if other parties look at it, it does get lowered. Do you know why that is? Yeah, it's absurd, and, and it and it it. It's quite a big, like, the, I think it's about five points. So it's quite a drastic, um, uh, you, you know, a, a drastic value. But I think you, you can avoid um, with certain parties checking your credit score. For example, you know, with rental agents, uh, you can provide a copy of your credit score and credit report to them. So that's one way of kind of bypassing it rather than them having to look you can just say, here's my credit score, here's my credit report, and then the, it won't impact your, your credit score. But you're right, absolutely, it does affect it, yeah. So where do we learn, where do we learn our credit score? So yeah, I'll, 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 tell you, I'll tell you this, yeah. So what is a, a good score? So a, a good score is, uh, it, there's a credit scoring model, and usually the credit scores, anything from 580, to 669 is considered a fair score. Anything from 670 to 739 is considered a good score. Anything from 740 to 799 is considered a very good score. And anything above 800 is excellent. So in a nutshell, the higher the score, the better it is, right? Your aim is to, to have a, a higher score. Why is your score important? So this is one example. Um, I've, I've just put it in a, in a graphical form. You have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage or a loan for $300,000. At the bottom, we have the credit score. So 
If your credit score is within the 500 to 559 range, your monthly payment is 3,317. As we move left, right, as your credit score is getting bigger, right, as we're moving towards the 720, 850 mark, you can see that the repayment amount shrinks drastically. Right, so this shows that the, the better your credit score, your monthly repayments of any loan, whether it's a mortgage, any loan, any payment plan you have, your, it will reduce. So the, the aim is to overall have, a, you know, a, a good credit score. What affects your credit score? So there's f four or five key um, components that, that make up the credit score. Your payment history is the, the biggest chunk. It's 35% um, of, of that factor that will impact the credit score. Amounts owed is 30%. Length of credit, how long you have had your credit for, that is 15%. New credit is 10%. And number of inquiries. So, so sister mentioned a, a, a good point. Uh, you know, the more inquiries you have on your credit score, that, that will uh, impact your credit score. So the important factors of, of a credit score is just uh, simply remember to make your payments on time. Right, it's better to make a small, a minimum payment rather than missing it and making a late payment. So, uh, you know, on time payments will include credit card repayments, loans, uh, finance company accounts, mortgages, auto loans. Any negative public records you have, so if you've had a bankruptcy claim or, you know, you've been in foreclosure, that's going to drastically have a negative impact on your credit score. And then we want to avoid delinquent accounts and amounts. You know, sometimes we get those red bills that eventually go into collections. Ideally, you want to avoid that situation. So the, your sister, the sister mentioned, where can you find your credit score? So the most reliable and trustworthy site is creditkarma.com. So you go online, you enter your social security number, your date of birth, and this website will be able to give you your credit score. And um, there's just some important facts to remember. Don't close unused cards as a short-term strategy. Some people use this that I'm going to close my accounts and my credit score will go up. It doesn't work like that. Um, the other um, important point to remember is if you have cards that have very minimum balance or zero balance and you haven't used them for a few months, please have some activity. It's better to keep those cards active in a small way rather than just keeping them open, right? So use cards with zero balance or activity at least uh, once every six months so they don't get closed um, uh, by the users, by the issuers, uh, and you don't, you don't close them. Don't open any new cards. You don't need to increase your credit. This is also a strategy that is misconceived that I'm just going to open up some extra lines of credit um, and it's going to boost up my, my credit score. Keep your balances low. That's the key to a good credit score, right? Just keep your balances low. And then there's a credit rule. It's, a, it's called the 30% credit rule. And this is where... Um, you should not, ha you should have, um, so I'm going to use an example. So if you have a $1,000 credit card limit, right, your 30% credit rule is that you should not have a balance over 300 outstanding for long on that account, right, because that's going to affect your credit score. So this 30% credit rule is really crucial for your credit card um, statements in particular. Any closed account you have will show up uh, on, on, your, uh, on your credit report. If you have late fees, missed payments, this will impact your credit score. So like I said, you know, it's, it's important to make that minimum payment 
rather than missing, you know, missing payments and doing late payments. I had a, a client a few months ago who was, you know, she couldn't make, she, you know, she got the reminders for her credit card statements. Um, and, you know, there was a minimum payment, I think in her case was about $25. And she said, I'm going to wait until I'm ready to pay the full bill off. Um, and she missed the minimum payment, that due date. So that autom automatically had a negative impact uh, on, on her credit score. Right? She was waiting to pay off the whole amount and she, it got late. But the key is that, you know, at least make that minimum payment. Right, because that is far better than missing a payment altogether or having a, a late payment. Um, so, you know, like I said, make it, making those timely payments are absolutely critical in impacting and increasing your, your credit score. So the next important component of, uh, of credit is a credit report. Anyone here, firstly, does anyone here have a credit score? Do they know their credit score, anyone? Do you, do you or no? No, you had this beautiful smile. So, oh, you did. Okay. No one has a credit score. You do. Okay. Okay. You know, it, it's free. There's no, you know, it, it's it, you just go to creditkarma.com, and uh, so two things I advise: go to creditkarma.com, retrieve your credit score, and number two, download your credit report. These are very crucial, you know, uh, elements. No, no. So I, I'm going to tell you. So, let, so, so I, I am also going to, um, because this does happen a lot. So that's why I, I, it's really important to, uh, to download your credit report because it also helps you identify those errors, right? And the other advantage of downloading your credit report is it can help uh, identify if there's any uh, identity theft going on. So very, very critical to, um, you know, to have your, your credit score and your credit report. Because I've been working with domestic violence victims, uh, I, I get this question asked very regularly too that, you know, uh, we don't have any credit cards, we don't have any loans, so we're, you know, we're not likely to get a credit score or a credit report. There is one way around that, and, and I'll, I'll discuss this, but going back to Chime, Chime.com, uh, you know, because for a first-time user, it's hard to get a credit card, right, particularly if you're not working, because that's one of the things they look at, your annual income. So Chime is a good um, uh, account to have because they don't have any fees, they're, they're kind of more lenient on first-time, uh, you know, first-time credit card users. So that's, uh, you know, one, one resource to, to utilize. But I know, I know with this group, I think pretty much everyone has, has a credit. Sorry? Chime, yeah. It's, it's a uh, CHIME. You can have a look online. So um, if you don't have a credit card, they... Um, that they are a bit more lenient as opposed to some of these other companies who look at your income and your credit score before they, they can issue you one. So um, the other uh, uh, option, if you do not have a credit card and you're a first-time user, is you can also approach, because um, banks are a bit more stringent and strict with their rules, um, credit unions are another place. They're a kind of an alternative of, a, uh, of banks. And so um, they're, they're more kind of more lenient too in terms of, um, for, but, sorry? Credit unions, yeah. No, no, credit unions, you can actually find them. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a financial institution. So you can find them in, in you know, in your neighborhoods, you know, their, their physical branches. You can go into, they, they provide the same um, functions as, as a bank. But uh, previously they, they worked, um, you, you know, you had to be part of a, like a union. But they've changed that now, right? Like, like for example, your employ you had to be working and, and be part of a union, but, but you, can, you can register with a credit union. And, and apply for a credit card. And, I, and, and going back to, uh, to your question, sister, so, so one option to build up your credit is 
if your if your spouse is a primary user, right? He has a bank account. He has a credit card with that bank account. So he's considered the primary user. You can be added as an authorized user. So he can get you a credit card in your name and you'll be considered an authorized user. Once you are an authorized user, you can start using that credit card. And that does, it will affect your credit score. Right, so you'll be able to get a credit score. You'll be able to, um, you know, have download a, a credit report. But if your spouse is the the downside is, if your spouse is not making regular payments, he's missing them, he's making them late, then that's directly going to affect your credit card. So you, I mean, you know your situation. Just be conscious that if your spouse is is you know making those monthly payments, he's consistent then you're good, right? That registered, uh, sorry, the authorized user will work. So, you know, a lot of sisters are in that setup where they're the authorized users. But the, you just have to be careful that, um, you, you know, if he's not paying them on time, it's going to directly affect your your score and, and your report. So um, so I hope that answers your question, sister, because um, I, I, get, I get that asked, asked a lot. Um, so, so it tells you, a, a credit report basically tells you the financial background and history if you have been repaying all your debts on time. And this information is, um, it tells the banks, and this is particularly useful if you want to get a loan out um, or, you know, a, a mortgage. Um, it tells the credit card companies and even the government. And the report is a summary of your credit history. So once you, you need to start using your credit cards to be able to get a credit score and a credit report. Um, loans will have an impact on your, on your score and your report, any borrowed money. Um, so all of that will, will be shown on your, on your credit report. Um, so lenders will check your credit report to make decisions about whether or not to grant you credit and about the rates and terms that you qualify for. So that's my next slide. So you're uh, obtaining your credit report. So you can request your credit report from a central website. And please, sisters, just use this one, annualcreditreport.com. There are, you know, when you, when you Google, you know, download credit reports, a thousand websites come up. And most of them are misled and not secure. The only trusted site recommended is annualcreditreport.com. It's a free resource, right? So you can either call them up or you can just go online, annualcreditreport.com, and download your report. So once you, uh, once you come to this website, there are three reporting um, crediting agencies or bureaus and you can get your credit report free it used to be um, available once a year and now uh, with the covid you can get it as as frequently as once a week so once a week you can obtain it free and so um, these are the three bureaus that that provide um, these reports equifax experian and transunion so when you go on to the annualcreditreport.com, these three will be able to provide you with your credit report. And typically, you, you, you need your SSN number and your date of birth as uh, a, a way to, to get in. Sorry. Do you have one general credit score, or is it one per uh, so, so these, they can, so your credit score will not be on your credit report. Your credit score is provided on the credit karma. These guys will provide, um, their own, uh, credit reports, but you you won't find your credit score on your credit report. And is there a difference between FICO score and credit score? Same thing. Yeah. FICO score. So if you see FICO score. And credit score, it's the same thing. Yes, yes. Credit Karma gives you credit score. This one is uh, annual credit report gives you your credit report. And who 
So you can download it online. So there's two ways of doing this. You can call them up. That you can get it mailed. The the quicker and safer way is just download it. Yeah, just you can just go onto their website, and uh, you know provide them with the credit card, uh, sorry your social security number, and your um, date of birth, and then they'll they'll be able to retrieve it and um, and and get that to you. So the annualcreditreport.com, um, the, the only way you can um, retrieve your credit report is your social security number. For those of you who do not have a social security number, you can ring up those agencies separately. So Experian, uh, the Equifax, TransUnion, you can ring them up individually and then you can give them your tax ID number. And then they will, um, you, you know, um, do like this identity um, verification by mail. You can only do this by, by mail if you do not have your social security number. So understanding your credit report. So your credit report is because it's your financial history, it's very comprehensive, very detailed. So no one here has one, right? Is that correct? No one has a credit room. Okay. So it is, um, it, it's going to contain your personal information, your name, your birth date, your address, your uh, SSN number, your employment details. It will have a whole section of your credit history, your payment history, your balance information up to your current status. So where you are uh, right un until now. It will also list any public records. So if you have any bankruptcy filings, unfortunately, those last up to 10 years on your credit reports. So you want to avoid you, you know, bankruptcies and, and foreclosures. Um, it also shows any inquiries, a uh, list of creditors or authorized parties that have requested a credit report in the last two years. So that will come up as well. That's why it's good to download it, right? Because it, it will tell you, um, you know, which people have accessed or, or wanted to, to gain um, access of your credit history. Some credit facts. So when you check or you pull your own credit score or credit report, it does not hurt your credit score. So going back to your question, sister, it, it does not if you pull your own credit report, right? You can pull, I mean, now you can download it as frequently as once a week. So you don't need to worry that it's going to impact your, your credit score. Credit inquiries made by companies that are checking your credit report to send you pre-approved offers, those do not impact your credit score either. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I'm assuming, do many of you get pre-approved offers, right? Where you, for credit cards, you get through email, you get these. So if those pre-approved offers are not impacting your credit scores, it's only when you have registered with a credit card, that's going to directly affect, affect your credit score and your credit report. So if you accept an offer and the credit card company or the lender pulls your credit report, then that will affect your, your, your credit score. And, and like I mentioned before, it can lower your score by about five points. So the best way to go about this is just provide a copy to your lender your employer, your rental agent, it is best to do it that way. And then, like I said, reviewing your credit reports helps you catch signs of identity theft early. So if you if you come across some transactions that, you know, don't seem right, ambiguous, you've queried them, it, it could be some fraudulent activity going on. So that's another big advantage of looking at your, your credit history. If, if the no, if the fraud is um, if it's been investigated, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. Yeah. So uh, and then uh, uh, another very important um, uh, point to make here is, please contact your so if you are having difficulty making your uh, payments, whether it's your credit card payments, whether it's uh, you know any payment you have with the creditor. Please contact them, 
right? It's it's better to contact your creditors than ignoring them and then the red letters are coming and then those amounts are being delinquent and then they're going into collections, right? So please, and I think the biggest, personally I find that the biggest um, creditor is uh, our medical bills, right? Like our insurance only covers a certain amount of, of, of medical bills, but we can, you know, there, when we get a medical bill, there's always a number that's given behind any bill that if you have problem or difficulty making this payment, please contact us. So this is absolutely critical that please sisters, if you're having difficulty making any sort of payment, please contact your creditors because you can negotiate and, and come to some sort of agreement and make a plan rather than just neglecting that payment and then it's going into collections and it's ruining your credit. So but fundamental advice. Okay, Jazakallah Khairin. Okay, has it started? Oh, Asr has started. So we, we can break here for, uh, for Asr. Salah, sisters, it started. Sorry, I do apologize. So we, okay, Bismillah. Okay, so we stopped at credit reports. So, um, you know, one advantage of downloading your credit report is to help you identify any errors. And there is a process involved if you do, um, uh, you know, identify any errors or even to correct them. So you must collect, an, uh, collect all evidence to dispute these errors. And you can do this either online or by mail. You need to report it to the agencies 30 days to verify and they'll temporarily exclude that discrepancy from your score. If the reporting agency is unable to verify the entry, then they must remove the error. If the error is removed, you can ask for a corrected version of the report and then get it sent to um, everyone who's received it in the last six months. So this is the, the post. That's why uh, it's, it's very critical that when you, when you download your credit report, please go through it extremely, like in fine detail, very thoroughly, because it is prone to, to errors. And, and then when you have identified an, an error and you want to correct it, this is the, the procedure involved. I think most most of you have anyone here who doesn't have a credit card. Oh, you don't. Okay. Um, so minimum age is eighteen. Um, uh, there's usually a, a credit card application. They will look at your credit score, your payment history, the length of time that you have had a credit, uh, that you've had credit uh, and income. Um, they. Uh, legally, they're not supposed to take in, into account your race, gender, religion uh, when you apply for a credit card. Has anyone had any difficulties in applying for a credit card? Everyone. How, how long have you guys had your credit cards? Been, it's been a while. And has it been through, that, um, through the spouse or your own? Mostly through the spouse's. Okay, I've heard for, for you who, um, who doesn't have one, Discover, I've heard great things about that, just an FYI, that if you want to consider uh, a credit card, Discover is a good one. Initially, when I didn't have credit history, I got one of those for the bank where you put the money, like you would probably Oh, I see. Oh, oh, right, okay. It, it is, compared to kind of these other credit card companies, uh, that was actually going to be my, uh, my my next slide. So if you have a, a bank account, right, if you have a savings account and you've been responsible with it, right, on, on a you know consistent basis, you've been using it, um, it it's, it's better and far easier than getting a first-time credit card through a bank that you've already established a good relationship rather than, you know, getting a credit card from a, 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 another company. Right. So, if you are with a with a good bank, you've developed a good relationship with them. They um, will will pre-offer um, and and possibly pre-approve you um, of a credit card, and and you can get one that way. So that's that's one uh, that, that's one route. And and it's better. I mean, you can apply for credit cards online as well. But my suggestion is, particularly if it's going to be your first time credit card. 
to do it in person. So, um, you know, to, to do it at a branch because I think the, um, you know, the representative will have more authority to get your application approved rather than you just submitting something online. So particularly if it's your first one, I strongly su suggest that it's in, in person. So if you are using our sponsor's credit card, is there a need to do this? No, no, no. No, no. If you're, if that, because you already got it. This is, yeah, yeah. This is for this sister who, who doesn't have one. So if you already got your spouses, you're an, an authorized user, then you don't need to do that, yeah. But, you know, you just need to, like I said before, just make sure that your spouse is making the payments on time. Because if he's not, it's going to jeopardize your credit uh, situation. Um, and so that's what this was. Okay, I wanted to very briefly touch upon loans. Does anyone have a loan here? You do? Okay. Anyone thinking of obtaining a loan? Okay, so I wanted to, there's, there's two types, two categories of loans. Um, one is uh, they come under secured loans, and the other category is unsecured loans. So secured loans are those loans um, that are backed by collateral, right? And so as the, the name suggests, secured, there's security for the lender, right? So an example would be a home loan or a mortgage, Right, because you're pledging uh, an asset against that loan. So with the with the lo with the home loan or mortgage, you're pledging your house. Right, your house is considered the collateral for that for that loan. So that's why this is considered a secured loan for the lender because you're pledging an asset against that loan. Auto loan is another example. Again, you, uh, your car is the, uh, the the car is the asset, and that will be the collateral for um, for that loan. So typically, because there's assets involved that you're pledging, uh, the interest rates are typically going to be lower for these type of loans as opposed to unsecured loans, right? So these uh, home loans or mortgages, auto loans, they come under secured loans. And the opposite to this is unsecured loans. So these are loans that uh, come without any collateral. You're not pledging any asset. So typically your personal loans or signature loans come under this. Um, so because there is no asset being pledged, they will look at your credits. These loans in particular, they'll look at your credit score more closely in terms of you need a higher score for these type of loans as opposed to the secured loans, right? So um, because there's no um, collateral or um, pledging with the assets, they are more, they're considered as more riskier for the lenders, so your interest rates are likely to be higher than your secured loans. And examples of, of uh, unsecured loans are your credit card loans, any personal loans, um, student loans, right? That comes under under unsecured loan. Um, and also, I've put IOU. How many people have heard IOU agreements? Okay. So, so IOU agreements are agreements that you typically make between family and friends where, you know, you're borrowing money. So I, I've, you know, because I work with DV clients, I've, you know, come across a lot of situations where unfortunately these IOUs, there's nothing in writing, right? And it just jeopardizes the relationship. So with the IOUs, please have a signed agreement um, whatever, you know, whoever you've made this financial transaction with, please make a signed agreement of, of that. I'm, I'm not aware of any, um, I mean, you, you can check, you can have a look. I'm, I'm not aware of any, um, I don't know if there's a template possibly, but uh, I strongly, I strongly recommend that that one is 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 used like a you know a, a writing template. Um, oh yeah, we can possibly Google it and and check. I'm not aware of of any that are readily available. Yeah. Is the witness needed on the paper, or it should be noted 
-hmm. Notarized will be even better. So if you can get it, if you can get it notarized, even better. But the minimum, yeah, it doesn't have to be, but I think that it just gives you that legal protection. So uh, yeah, excellent point. I think not notarizing um, that document will, will give it more, more legal status. But at least the bare minimum is at least have it signed because a lot of these IOU agreements are all verbal. Like, I owe you 50 bucks, I'll give you, I'm just giving you a small example, I'll give you next week and then you forget about it and then it never happens. But particularly where, regardless of the amount, because anything we give to someone, it's an amana, right? But unfortunately, they are, I mean, even within families, within siblings, you hear these horrific stories where brothers and sisters, they've given loans to each other just because they're family and they never returned, right? They don't even acknowledge that this payment was ever made. So, you know, astaghfirullah, we're accountable to Allah. And so we have to, the bare minimum is to have a signed agreement. Notarizing will be would be even better. What about emails? Email exchange without a signature? Yeah, I, I'm still, uh, signed is the minimum. I think even email, I mean, uh, that, that doesn't hold much bearing. Okay. The bare minimum, it should be signed. Notarized will be even better. But these verbal agreements, they don't, they don't stand. They have no bearing. Within family, we've we've heard everyone must have heard so many stories like that. Where unfortunately, within your own, you know, your parents, your siblings, that money is gone, right? So um, that's why I've put this in there that at least uh, please have it signed because you know it, it, it's it's an amana. And um, talking about signing, this um, leads me on to, so before, sisters, before you sign anything, and this again is, goes back to my, my line of work, before you sign anything, please read all the terms, all the conditions, all the fine print, because, um, you know, a lot of the times uh, things crop up later and because you've already signed, you've already become into this legally binding contract and it's too late to, to pull out. Once you've signed, you can't pull out, right? So before you sign anything, please read everything in, in detail. And particularly with loans, there's something called prepayment penalties, Right, so prepayment penalties. Sometimes with the loans, you may decide to pay them off earlier than originally agreed. Right, for example, a home loan. It may be a 30 year loan, you may be ready to pay it off in 15 years. Right, some of them have the condition or have this caveat of a prepayment penalty. So, this is a penalty that is imposed if you decide to pay your loan off early. Banks will impose this. So before you sign your paperwork, check please that, you know, check, read the clauses, read the fine print, read about the prepayment penalty before you, you agree on, on the loan and the conditions. And also before you sign, you are able to negotiate right up to the point before you sign, you can negotiate your terms and conditions. So please do use that opportunity. Like once you get something from the bank or anywhere, right, in writing, you, before you sign up to the point of when you sign, you have that opportunity to negotiate. So please use your negotiation um, and, 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 you know, and get that done. Because, like I said, once you've signed, it's the final deal and you, you've entered a legally binding contract. So that's a, a very, very important point. And then the other um, point I wanted to make is um, something called predatory lending. So this is like the predators, right, where you, if you feel that um, any financial institution that or, um, you know, any company that you're trying to get a loan with and you're feeling pressurized, you should never feel pressurized in, uh, you know, by any sort of financial institution. Um, or if you feel that there's some sort of unfair practice, so there's a, it's an abuse, you know, some form of abuse going on with this organization or uh, the institution, um, you know, as uh, as a tactic in lending you that money or you being forced to, you know, take on this 
this loan or this payment, that is wrong, right? This, can't, this falls under predatory lending. And there's a website here, www.usa.gov.consumer, and that gives you very specific consumer protection information because it's illegal to, to use these tactics to try to lure you to, um, you know, get forcefully uh, uh, accepting some of these conditions of the loans. So if you feel you've been a, a victim of predatory lending or you want to reach a potential lender, then please go to this usa.gov information um, site and, and they'll be able to help you. Okay, uh, another very important um, aspect I wanted to cover is uh, our documents, right? So um, how many people here have access to their documents? documents so any document at home, a any document, you have full access? Everyone has full access to document? So documents will cover... Uh, so I'm going to break these up. So ideally, there's five categories of, of, of documents that we should have access to. And it's good to organize them in, in, in these categories for ourselves because it, it just helps you with, um, you know, future planning. Financial records, right? We should have access to financial records. This includes our bank statements, credit card agreements, any money order receipts, loan documents, right? Any documentation with regards to your finance, you should have full access to. Number two, legal documents, right? Birth certificate, marriage license, if you're divorced, a divorce decree, social security cards, immigration paperwork, if you are in an abusive relationship, a restraining protective order, Right? We must all individually have access to this. It does that we shouldn't rely on our spouses that they're the men of the house and you know they, they should be in. We should at least the bare minimum, at least A, know where they are. If we cannot access the originals, the minimum is to have copies of them. I strongly advise that if you cannot have original documents of these, have at least the, mini the minimum copies of these. And once you have copies of these documents, then you have to organize them. And, and, and these are the five key buckets that how you should organize. You should have a separate bucket or folder for your financial record, a separate folder for your legal documents, a separate folder for your property documents. So this will include if you're renting your rental lease, if you, uh, um, if you own a house, your title, your deed, um, your vehicle registration, your insurance policies. If you have valuables, ladies, if you have jewelry, gold, please make sure you have at least pictures of it, right? We have to, you know, we have to have this safety plan in place in case of, God forbid, anything happens and then we're faffing around trying to figure out, you know, where to find find everything. So property documents, health records, right? Our medical, dental, vision, health, any life insurance policies we have, disability insurance, medical expense receipts, list of doctors. If you have a will, all of these should be kept under your, your health records. And then your expense documents, your household bills. It's just like I said, at least the bare minimum should be to keep if you don't have physical access, to at least have copies. Because I've, I've come across so many sisters in our community, separation, divorced, widowed, and then, you know, tragedy strikes and they're completely clueless. They don't know where to begin because they don't know, like, where to find, you know, the, these documents. So at least know, if you don't know where they are, Try to find them, try to make copies of them, and just keep them safe, right? If you feel, for whatever reason, you cannot keep them safe in your house, you can keep them in a bank safe deposit box, you can keep them in a trustworthy friend, family's member, but at least you should have your own access to them and your own records.
I, you know, like I said, in my line of work, I've come across so many sisters who were completely oblivious because they were fully dependable on their spouses uh, who ran the show. And then, you know, something happened and they didn't know where to where to start. So so this is um, very, very critical, critical advice. And so this leads me into I just want to very briefly touch upon um, financial abuse. Has anyone heard what financial abuse is? Or okay, so quite a few. Okay, mashallah. So financial abuse, it is a form of domestic violence. There are many forms of domestic violence. Unfortunately, financial abuse is, is one of them. Uh, physical abuse, technological abuse, spiritual abuse, emotional abuse. Right? There's there's many uh, you know, there's there's many forms. Unfortunately, there's this misconception that you just have to be covered in bruises and scars to, to be uh, for that to, to come under domestic abuse. But it, there, there's many forms, and so financial abuse is one of them. Uh, so this particular abuse, um, like the others, it begins very subtly, right? And then it progresses over time. It's a pattern of abusive behavior. It's used to gain and maintain power and control within the relationship. And often this traps the survivor in, in the relationship. So here are some tactics that are used in financial abuse, right? So if you recognize them, then unfortunately this is a, a sign of financial abuse. Stealing money from you or your family. So if your spouse is doing this, this is a form of financial abuse. Forbidding you from working or getting an education. Forcing you to work and or hand over any income, any assets or any benefits. So if you are working and your spouse is forcing you to provide your earnings to him, then that is a form of, abu uh, of abuse. If you're doing this voluntarily you want to spend on your spouse your children your house that's separate but if you are being forced to to you know provide the earnings to the spouse that is a form of financial abuse controlling how money is spent making all the financial decisions withholding financial information Forcing you to sign or file fraudulent legal documents or benefits, right? So these are some further tactics that come under financial abuse. Preventing you from obtaining or using credit cards or bank cards. Threatening to report you for cheating on your benefits. So if you are claiming benefits and your spouse is threatening you that they will report you to the, to the benefits agency, uh, that is a, a, a tactic of, of financial abuse because it's, it's a form of, of power and control. Overusing credit cards or refusing to pay your bills. So that's why I, I, I keep reiterating, Sister, your point that if you are an authorized user, right, under your spouse's name, then, you know, just make sure that he's paying the payments on time. Because if he's overusing his card and he's not making the monthly, it's going to directly impact your credit score. So, yeah. Did that person take their name off? Yes, yes. That per I think um, I have to double check, but I... Um, the, 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 the disadvantage is also your spouse can just take you off because he's the primary account holder. So he doesn't even have to get your permission. He, he, he can just have you removed at any time and you won't even know about it. Unless, uh, unless you use the card, exactly. Because I, I had a client, this same situation happened to. She didn't, he didn't notify her. She went to use the card and it was rejected. She rang the bank and he had changed, um, uh, he had changed the, um, uh, uh, the mailing address. So because the spouse is the primary account holder, he could do or she could do what he wants 
or they want, she wants. Um, I'm using he because mostly it's the <laughs> it's the husband who does it, but it, it could be it could be women as well. It could be the wives, yeah. So, so usually, the, so that is very, very common. That is, but uh, kind of, if she's going through the, the 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 divorce, the court will look at this, right? Because they they do this audit trail where, you know, they'll check that the joint accounts have been emptied. So, uh, I mean, uh, this is a very common tactic that the husbands use that they'll empty out and move around their assets and even move their funds abroad. But there is there is an audit trail, and and um, you know the the courts can retrieve you know bank statements. So, um, but the, yeah, that that happens very commonly. Where okay. she believes like that's gone. Yeah, I, I I'm not too sure about. I mean, this is a kind of a family a, attorney question. I don't know realistically if those funds can be retrieved. Um, but I know that the courts do. Did you want to chime in on this? There's a financial discovery portion. If she can prove how she's contributed and whatnot, that turns into that. So, so what happens if, because this happens a lot, right? A lot of the sisters, they're not working. They're fully financially dependent on their spouse. And then, you know, they're going through a divorce, they get divorced, and then the joint accounts have been emptied. So, do they have access then to that to the to the joint money or that money's you know when you deposit there's a record? Like if she's using her card it's her name or whatnot. So if she hasn't contributed, how does that work then? Um it, that's where the attorney comes Yeah, from. yeah. The, also, I wasn't from that exact but I know there's work and her work with the attorney. So yeah. There's another way to spend this, this is, you know, this question, sister, this is such an important question because it just goes back to my previous slide, why we need to have our documents, right? We each want, regardless of our situation, alhamdulillah, you know, we're good right now, but we don't know about tomorrow. So uh, it's, it's absolutely critical that we must have these documents, Absolutely, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Well, I mean, if you if you can't access, you know, your husband's documents, then at least just have yours organized. Yeah, I mean uh, that comes under financial abuse, right? It's it's um, because it's all about control. So you know the the transparency has to be there. So I did, and we're going to cover this. Um, uh, so we we've done some tactics, and then I I will share with you. So it, th so this slide kind of I think answers your your question. So what does a healthy financial relationship look like? Right. So, unfortunately, 99% of domestic violence survivors are have experienced some form of financial. There's a very close correlation between domestic violence survivors and financial abuse. Right. And so, um, at least we need to be aware of what is it. What is it? What is a healthy financial relationship? So, a healthy financial relationship is where both partners. Right. So the emphasis here is on is on both. Both partners have access to financial statements, to information, despite the fact that one, you know, that one of the partner is working, right? So your spouse, your husband may be working, he's managing the finances, but a healthy relationship is where both the husband and wife have access to your financial statements and information. Secondly, couples feel safe to identify and voice when they have different values about money and negotiate financial goals. So again, it should be a joint decision-making process. I had um, a, a client a few months ago who, who told me that uh, her husband bought a Tesla and didn't tell her just randomly came one day, parked it in the driveway. And, you know, Teslas are not cheap. It's a big investment. It's a big purchase. 
and he just he just randomly you know parked it and uh, he just said hey i've uh, i've bought a new car right and and that's wrong i didn't see I can't make my wife happy. <laughs> so, so, so the 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 funny part was so the Tesla he so so the husband it, it was it was his car, right? So he didn't think it was necessary to tell the wife because he's driving it. But I mean, just think of the 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 large amount that's been spent. Right, and he didn't think it's important enough to tell the wife because the mindset is, well, I'm working, so it's my money. I can do what I want. Right, so this is this is wrong. And the other thing, Islamically, that I think a lot of our sisters, I had this conversation in my in my last session, is you know, for for those of us who are working, our money that we earn. Alhamdulillah, I mean, mashallah, Islam is, 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 is a beautiful religion. Our money is our money. We don't have any legal or, you know, Islamic obligation to spend that on our family, on our house, on our children, on our spouse. We don't have that. That is the husband's. Husband's duty is he's the guardian of the house. He has to provide. So what we, whatever we earn Islamically, that belongs to us. We can choose to spend it, right? Through it voluntarily, we can choose to spend it on the children, on the spouse, on the husband. We can choose that. But him demanding that whatever you're earning and that's coming to me, that's wrong. So we, it's really important because I, I know, mashallah, most of us know this, but I've done so many sessions where sisters are like, wow, we didn't know this. Uh, we're just giving our earnings to our husband. So, you know, I mean, especially living in the Bay Area, you need dual incomes, right? But typically, you do need both parties to work to be able to sustain a certain standard of living. But, you know, don't feel pressurized or obliged that I have to financially do this for this it, voluntarily yes by all means but you there's no fundamental responsibility to do that is the spouse the the husband um so both recognize and respect that decision making is equal regardless of who earns more income each partner can have access to their money on their own so that's the other thing you know some of the sisters they have a joint uh, a joint account but then they're not allowed access to it. It's really bizarre. Like, you know, I've, I've had stories where, you know, sisters are like, you know, we've got a joint account, but, you know, my husband's taken my PIN number. So I can't access the funds. I'm like, well, that's wrong. Like a joint account, bare minimum, you should have access to that. So even with the joint account, you, there are some accounts that require both Partner, both parties to be present for, to make a transaction or a withdrawal. So you have to see, um, you know, there's um, either there's a or, like so it could be, for example, myself, you know, Saima Zia or my spouse, right? We'll just say Rick Zia, right? Saima Zia or Rick Zia. So if it's an or account, then either one of us can go and use that account independent. We don't need to get each other's permission. But there are some joint accounts that are and, so then both parties have to be present or you need at least the signature of the other party to make a withdrawal or, you know, a, a transaction. So with your joint accounts, just be vigilant on, be wary on um, kind of what are, the, what are the conditions on how that joint account works because, uh, you know, some, you have to have both people present. So the the or is better where you know you have you have access independently. Bank yeah, yeah, bank accounts, yeah. And so both are knowledgeable about how money is spent, right? So I've just given you the Tesla example. So you have to be, um, you know, you need to know. So this the, I, the, this is um, kind of a framework of what a healthy financial relationship should look like. Realistically, we know that it's very difficult to achieve this, right? To, to have this in a, in a marriage. 
But I think uh, as, you know, to empower ourselves, the, the minimum is to at least understand that, you know, this is, this is a healthy financial relationship. And, uh, you know, if, if these things are not being done, then that's wrong, right? But then, you know, you can try to communicate with your spouse and tell him that, look, th you know, th uh, this is a healthy financial relationship should be where both of us are involved. But, um, you know, it's, you all, you all, you know, um, you know your situations better than anyone, right? If you think that that conversation or that this issue is going to cause friction, right, then, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I mean, what can you do? But I think my point is that at the bare minimum, just understand that, you know, this is a healthy financial relationship, these things that we spoke about. And it's, it's both parties are involved. Both parties are involved in the financial decision-making process. They're involved in the, um, uh, you know, the access. And they know exactly what the, you know, the, the, the finances are, what, what their situation is. And so I want to very briefly touch upon investments. So investments and taxation and retirement, that's a very specialized um, area. Uh, Narika actually do um, workshops for this, but I just very, br very briefly wanted to touch upon this. So financial instruments, uh, fi investments are financial instruments you buy with the hope that your money will grow in the future. Right, that's what an investment is. Why should I invest? To build wealth for retirement, for education, right? If you're trying to save up money for your children's education, investment is, is one way of, of doing that. To buy a house for your children, for recreation. And then I've just listed, there's a lot more, um, but th these are some uh, advanced investment vehicles that uh, are commonly used stocks. So shares is a, a, co a common one where, you know, you, um, the stocks represent proportional shares of ownership in the company that you are interested in investing. They work on a, on a stock exchange. And I've just put an example here. If you buy 10,000 shares of a stock in a company, so say for example, BP, right, the oil company, you buy 10,000 shares of that stock, and 100, uh, it has 100,000 shares issued, so that you're owning 10% of that of that company. So stocks are traded on public uh, on stock exchange, and you know buyers and sellers come together. The other uh, very commonly used investment vehicle is corporate bonds. So with, with any of these, I str if you are considering investments, I strongly advise you speak to a financial advisor. So, if, you know, you do get, and I, if you, you know, want any recommendations, you can come and speak to me um, uh, after this session. I, I do have a couple of uh, reputable advisors who provide a free consultation so you can get some, you know, further advice on kind of what are the the better um, investment opportunities for you. So corporate bonds is another real estate, right? That's considered an investment. Some people want to invest in purchasing properties, right, as a, as a form of investment. Gold, silver, right, that's considered an investment to purchase that and, um, and to retain that. Do... Um, also be careful with investment fraud. Um, do not be afraid to invest, but always be aware. There are, unfortunately, a lot of investment fraud. So just be wary. Um, there's, you know, a lot of scammers around. There's a um, one particular fraud, very common one, guaranteed profit from penny stocks, right? It's a, it's a tactic that's, that's used, um, but, I, but it's, it's, a, it's mostly by scammers. Fraudulent business opportunities, email scams, right? So, um, uh, so you could avoid fraud just being informed. Find mentors. So, like I said, you know, really speak to financial planners and seek advice. So, if you are seriously considering any form of investment, um, you know, please at least speak to a financial planner and, and seek uh, the advice. If an investment opportunity seems too good to be true, then run, right? Then that 
is risky. If you feel that, oh my God, this is great, it's going to make me a lot of money, I'm going to you know, get rich, um, gain a lot of profit, there's something dodgy in that. So, um, you know, if it seems too good, um, run. Do not make any irrational decisions, right, without, without doing your, your research. And I've just put together some websites that um, you, you can, so as resources, if you need to find some uh, additional information on investment, click to empower, investor.gov, investorpedia, beginners invest or about, and google.com finance. It, uh, this last one, the google.com, so, um, you know, reading the headlines, like if you're, for, for example, considering um, purchasing some stocks, this one, google.com.finance, will give you some headlines about what is happening with the companies, right? So, so for example, if someone's recommended, you know, buy some shares with Twitter, right? And we know what's been happening with, with Twitter. So it's, it's really important to know what's happening about that company um, by reading the headlines. So those are some, um, some resources. Um, so that's it what I had on um, the, the main presentation. I had a, um, a pop quiz. So I don't know if uh, it's 10 past five. I've, I've, I'm, I'm just a bit mindful of everyone's time. We can go through this very, t if you want, very quickly together. Um, let me, um, so just bear with me. We'll, we'll close on this and uh, I'll take some Q&A as well, inshallah. Okay. Okay. So we've covered quite a lot of terminology today. So I'm going to kind of do a, a quick quiz. Um, debt. How would you define a debt? Anyone? Sorry? Money you are. Exactly. So yeah, just give me, you can just give me one, um, you know, one worded answers on this. That's fine. Um, a budget. Yes, I would say a tool to manage your money. Yeah, excellent. Withdraw. Yes, taking out money. Online banking. Yes, exactly. That's how I remember it. Internet banking, online banking, it's the same, and you do it on online, exactly. Mobile banking on your phone, exactly. An account. What is an, an account? So um, I've, I would define it more as a, um, uh, you know, like a, like a, yeah, I mean, that, that is right, something like a transactions, right, transactions um, uh, form, form an account, a balance. Yes, money that's, uh, that's left. assets, what you owe, exactly, a transaction, yes, exactly. Credit score? Yes, excellent. Marshall, credit worthiness, yes. Uh, expense? So is it sp expense is a cost, right? Something that you're having to spend money on. So uh, um, a cost. Uh, income? Earnings. Earnings, yep. So income is any, any form of money coming in. Um, a check. Yeah, it can, yes. It can be a written statement, yeah. Um, investment. To make your money grow, yeah. Mortgage. Loan on a house, excellent. A loan. Something that you borrow, yeah. Fees. Additional charges. Penalties. Cons yeah. Consequences. Tax. Something we all have to pay on everything, right? <laughs> on our income tax, sales tax, everything has tax. Down payment. Yeah, you put a, a payment down on, on, on a house. Excellent, mashallah. 
so that's that's uh, that's all I had for the for the presentation. Um, any questions? Yes, I can. Um, I have to speak to um, someone from MCC who I think. Have you all registered? Did you register for the? So if you registered, I think you've obviously um, we've got your email addresses. Yeah. So I will uh, I will get uh, Sister Anjuman to um, share this presentation with you. Yeah. So oh, you so have. Did you ever, uh, Yes, because then we have. If you, if 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 there were any walk-ins, uh, I think if there were, if there are any sisters who who just came in, then um, I can take your email address and then I can share this with you. But those who are registered, you should inshallah, I, I will get this email to you, so you have your own notes. Any other questions? Feedback? Anything that can be added, improved? Um, this, uh, this particular session, it, it's more for um, sisters just to give them uh, an overview, but it's also um, like a beginner's workshop, right? Like, like the, there's there's far marked, you know, finance is, is very widespread, so there is, you know, like investments is a, is a workshop in its own, right? Taxation is a workshop in its own. Uh, retirement plans, 401ks. Right, that's that's you know there's there's far more to learn, but this is just um, like I said, a beginner's like a, it's a stepping stone, and and I and I think as sisters because I, I'm a big advocate on on women's empowerment, so this you know uh, is so crucial for this financial empowerment. We really need to uh, you know empower ourselves financially. Because I've unfortunately come across so many sisters in our community, and it's it's so sad to see them in this condition, because they were completely clueless, right? So this is I've actually started to roll this out among um, even my my daughters here, among uh, young young girls, teenagers. Our daughters need to learn this. I I came across um, someone a couple of months ago, who a newly married couple. Uh, never discussed financial planning, financial management, work situation. It wasn't even important. And I'm sure, you know, when we got married, we didn't, I didn't, I mean, I will talk first and foremost about myself. I didn't discuss, have this conversation with my husband about what will happen with the finances, who will be in charge, who's going to work. It didn't even come up. So anyway, this couple recently got married and the, the guy had a, uh, a, a large debt. And so he got married, and then he expected his wife to help pay off this huge debt. And she's like, well, you didn't address this or you didn't, you know, discuss this before the marriage. How am I supposed to, you know, um, why are you kind of imposing this on me now? So it's very, very important, like, for our children, particularly our daughters, to empower them with this. Right, just at least the bare minimum, kind of give them this skill um, of financial literacy, so that you know when they go into a marriage, they know how to make a budget, they know how to set financial goals, they know some of this terminology, they know about the banking system, they know they should be putting money aside for a rainy day, they should have their own savings account, right? All of this we must educate ourselves and then our children. Because, uh, you know, um, you know you, subhanAllah, knowledge is power. And, um, it, you know, it, it, it will just, I think just having this awareness will also, inshallah, kind of some of the problems we're having in our community, it will prevent those, right? So um, I, I, I want to, you know, thank each one of you to take this time out to, I hope, inshallah, even if I've just benefited one sister, that I've achieved my goal. Because um, I, I learned this myself and I, I just want to, as my Sadhka Jariya, convey this knowledge to others so that, you know, they can benefit. And then hopefully they can pass it along to, you know, friends, family. So inshallah, I'll share this presentation so you have access to the slides. Um, and then, yeah, you can reach out to me um, separately too. Um, I don't, but I can find out. 
Yeah, I know. I mean, Narika because they're a DV organization, so they do these workshops, but they're only for their clients who are domestic violence survivors. But um, I can find out. I, I do know a couple of financial advisors, so I can ask if there, if you, you know, if there is a demand in the community to do something on investments, do something on taxation, do something on retirements, 401ks. Then, you know, if the demand is there, I, c I can definitely um, address that and ask for that. But so far, kind of my experience has been that even this, which is considered, it's basic stuff. We've heard about it, but you know, a lot of us are still not, you know, um, familiarized with, with these basic concepts. So, um, yeah. Okay. In okay. 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 Inshallah. That's a good idea. Okay. Inshallah. I know we had a lot more sisters registered who didn't show up. So, um, uh, you know, inshallah, I, I, this is being recorded, but I'm hoping to, um, you, you know, come back here. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this at different massages, so to kind of, um, you know, cater for, for more women. But inshallah, khair, uh, I, I just think from my experiences with particularly working with these uh, DV survivors, it just made me realize that particularly among the immigrant community, South Asian immigrant community, uh, unfortunately, sisters are completely oblivious. They're just blindingly, they just rely on their spouses. And then when something happens, well, you don't know, right? It, it doesn't have to be separation, even death, right? If your spouse passes away, you don't know where to begin. So very important, yeah. Yeah, I, I can give you my, my email address. So yeah, you can contact me by by email. Yeah, the uh, if it's more so you know we we uh, we touched upon financial abuse. So if it if you f if you feel it's a question regarding that, then I would go through Narika. You can you know the the uh, the people who are here. I would go through Narika, and um, you know they can reach out because I uh, I, I volunteer through them. And so um, we can do it that way. So, uh, but if it's a, a generalized question, uh, I'm, you know, I'm happy to to answer that. But if it's if it's uh, you know abuse related, then uh, it's best to go through Narika. And so, yeah. But um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming out on a on a Sunday afternoon. And um, you know, if you want my contact details, I can. Um, Inshallah, I, I can share those with you. I'm actually just going to put it up on the on the board.